there a serious shift by major manufacturers out of China to source in other countries? That's the topic of my conversation today with Juan Reboldi. He is principal and president of Ascent Advisor. Juan, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be with you here. So are we seeing serious consideration by major consumer brands and manufacturers about shifting production out of China? I think so. I think that there's enough evidence that there is a shift and this is a part of a long-term pattern. This is not just, if you look at it uh, myopically, you would think that this is just a response to current, um, you know, um, presidential, you know, policies and things like that. But if you look more broadly, you could see that the pattern on how we have engaged with China for the last several decades and how we're now repositioning our, our engagement with China is part of a broader pattern of geopolitical nature. Mm-hmm. And looking more specifically at companies that are making these decisions, you can see that uh, companies large and small are noticing the increased amount of risk and the decreased amount of advantage of uh, low cost of labor working with China and finding other markets that provide equally low cost of labor and sometimes less economic or political risk. Not to mention wage rates in China have been on the rise in recent years. So that's another factor that, you know, Correct. Yeah. the advantage that, that China mm-hmm. has. The question then becomes, if not China, then where? Um, we hear, for instance, uh, Mexico is a possibility. We hear about Apple, uh, perhaps shifting some, some of that Foxconn and Pegatron to gigantic, uh, you know, uh, Uh, contract manufacturers looking at factories in Mexico. What are some of the alternatives that are strongly being considered right now? So those are some of the main ones. I would say that India definitely provides an attractive long-term partner for the U.S. as well as for a lot of the world uh, for many different services. For the U.S., Mexico is a natural manufacturing partner. The cost of labor has become competitive with that of countries like China, maybe still higher, but there are other advantages and proximity and maybe some easier trade relations with Mexico. Mm -hmm. And also there's a very skilled labor force in Mexico. And so so you can find the same in India. And then if you're looking for the lowest cost of labor, there are several Asian countries like Cambodia and uh, Vietnam and, and you know, those countries that are, that are uh, also providing very attractive options from a low cost of labor. Mm-hmm. Depending on what you're producing, the value That's of right. the merchandise, that would, that would uh, right. make that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, the question though is, are these other countries able to reproduce the scale mm-hmm. of operations that China had? I mean, Foxconn with tens of thousands of workers at a given factory site, can other countries match that? Not in the near future. I think that that's what you're seeing is a gradual shift and and investing in capabilities, testing the models. So still we rely heavily on Chinese manufacturing for a lot of goods that if today were not available, there would be a huge shortage. Mm -hmm. But um, those capabilities are being developed and they're being tested. I think that you're also going to notice maybe a shift of some manufacturing that can come uh, domestically again. Things mm. that we have been reshoring, actively offshoring, that mm-hmm. will come back as a response of you know, economic pressures internally, as well as you know, people's unemployment willing to, to work and manufacturing jobs that maybe are an option that they have not it, been. It seems like a lot of companies have learned this lesson recently about the danger of consolidating all their manufacturing in a particular country. And I'm wondering if now with these decisions, once they start thinking about getting out of China, is it economically viable for them to spread it around a little bit to like get parts in one place, put in parts in here and parts in there and pull it all together? Or is that a too difficult a proposition to, to, to I, carry out? I think out? it's going to become economically necessary because uh, we're seeing an increased amount of risks for a number of different reasons, I mean, including the pandemic and the fact that all of a sudden we were heavily depending on critical supplies from China that they couldn't produce and coming to the country fast enough. 
So for a number of different reasons, you're going to see a lot of companies starting to diversify their supplier uh, sources and that way it kind of offset the risks. Mm-hmm. And I've seen it already that, that there is a primary and secondary and tertiary levels of suppliers and you're willing to keep them all, you know, in, in a kind of like a testing mode to see, you know, who you're going to be needing long term. Yeah, well, Apple is famous for spreading it around just because making one part here, one part there, bringing it all together in another place, taking it somewhere else. They've had a very complex supply chain all along. But it, it, up to this point, it seems like all roads have ended up going through China one way or another. Um, so it's interesting to hear that, that, that there's a consideration to do, do something else. However, number one, it's no easy task moving an entire manufacturing operation from one country to the other. So how long does that take? What's involved in making sure that all your suppliers are on board with the move at the same time? Yeah, doing it correctly, doing it in a planned way takes multiple years, as we well know, and developing capabilities, developing the relationships is a multi-year process. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we've seen the world pivot in incredibly fast amount of times when things have to be done and they're not maybe under ideal conditions. So could under certain conditions, uh, things pivot much rapidly, they, they can. Uh, maybe not without a lot of bumps along the way and shortages, but, but can be done faster. I think that the current approach is to take a, a planned multi-year uh, approach of de-risking dependence on just China. Yeah. What are some of the challenges involved, though, in entering countries where you weren't there before with markedly different political systems than you're used to when factoring in China? You mentioned India. It is a democracy, yeah. that, which is great. <laughs> but on the other hand, that might mean it, it's harder to get things done there. I mean, is, is, that a, still, is that a viable place for that? How do, you get, how do you cut through the bureaucracy that you're liable to run into in a country yeah. like that? Absolutely. I mean, and every country has its own nuances and, and cultural differences. But India, for example, is a kind of country that things take longer. Mm-hmm. And there is way too many middlemen and, and, and steps along the way. It's a very bureaucratic process. So as opposed to China, that things are a little bit more straightforward, cut and dry, you can get things going faster. In China, things will tend to take longer. And there are some advantages, on the other hand, there's probably more of an English speaking population. There's that uh, alignment with the concept of democracy and um, you know, from, from uh, political alignment with the US right now, there may be a more of a longer term uh, partnership, but the barriers are pretty significant. And, and mm-hmm. you know, we should be aware that things will be done differently when they're done in different countries. In fact, I talked with someone that was an entrepreneur that was outsourcing uh, manufacturing to different parts of the world, including uh, Eastern Europe, Latin America, and Asia. And he was kind of characterizing how the culture of those places has a big impact into what he can get out of these places. Mm-hmm. So in one area, it may get more of a technical depth, while other is more of a creative uh, solution. Well, in China, maybe more of like purely mass production and, and, and you know, rope price type of uh, advantages. And bring that all together in a single supply chain for, a, for one kind of product, that just seems like an enormous challenge. I'm wondering, to, to the extent that companies have been motivated by the state of trade relations between the U.S. and China and the trade war, to what extent are maybe some of the major manufacturers holding back right now? Because we are in a presidential election year. Who knows a year from now whether there will be tariffs or not tariffs, what our policy toward China will be. Maybe they don't want to make such a, a hasty move before they find out what the what, what that looks like, or are they just gonna are they pulling out stakes and moving anyway? So I would say short term, and between now and mid November, I'm sure everyone is starting to you know hedge their bets, seeing where things are going, see how much they really need to go in a different direction or not. Mm-hmm. Long term, I believe that the pattern is set to diversify risk for a number of uh, increasing geopolitical issues. And also to um, take advantage of the competitive advantages that different countries can provide that we have not properly exploited maybe and and overlooked because we were just focusing on low cost of labor. And that advantage has been uh, increasingly eroding. 
Given the complexities of the situation that we've just been talking about for the last 10 minutes or so, is it possible for you to name one country that you think holds the greatest promise as being an alternative to China? I, I almost has, hesitate to call it the new China because I know how, sim how oversimplification comes in in that sort of consideration. But what country, if you can name one, seems to be potentially the biggest beneficiary of this change? Okay. I would say that Mexico definitely has an eye on this shift. And for several years, I have been talking with uh, colleagues of mine that have uh, manufacturing set up in Mexico and starting to claim competitive uh, position with China. Now, Mexico and China are completely different in types of scale and capability of production. Mm -hmm. India, on the other hand, has a similar capacity to scale, but it is going to be a slow process to get the infrastructure and the relationships and, and things set up. We had a, a several decades of history developing software in, in India. So the India development has been around for a long time. Sure. India manufacturing is, is, a, is a fairly new concept that is starting to take root. So I think it will take some time. There's always been the concept that Brazil could someday be if you will, another China in South America. Mm -hmm. Brazil has significant uh, challenges yet to overcome to prove that they can do that. But the manufacturing coming out of Brazil can be uh, very good quality. Uh, there's mm -hmm. still quite a bit of issues to, to get us to that point. Yeah, yeah. Brazil seems to come and go as a candidate depending on what's happening at any given moment, but it is yeah. interesting to, to just consider it. Well, Juan Riboldi, thank you very much for helping to kind of sketch out for us what are some of the considerations and give us an idea that there is, in fact, some real movement out of China. Mm -hmm. Who knows how long it'll take, but companies are definitely doing it. We will look, uh, Juan, for your upcoming book, Strategic Transformation, How to Deliver What Matters Most. So um, thanks very much. Look forward to reading that. And in the meantime, thanks for being with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Yeah.